The parable of the prodigal son had already been mentioned previously, particularly in the contemplation named The Eternal War. However, I realize that it has not been properly contemplated in all its inherent ramifications. Being a rich myth, its worth resides in the outline of the story much more than on the details, the twerk as an artistic and cultural embellishment, much needed for our minds to have something to digest. Yet, a truth-pointing outline goes directly beyond the mind, beyond the words, beyond also the imagery conveyed, and, particularly, beyond even the emotions it may trigger. Surpassing both the worded and imaged subconscious, as well as the silent, thoughtful conscious, such an outline reconnects directly beyond both that are still belonging to the mind of the world, and communicates with the original individual purity in truth and life through the ego. This can only occur when the ego is healthy enough to establish such a connection. When that happens, an inspiration, a creativity comes upon the conscious in the form of thoughts, and these thoughts are then translated to words and images in the subconscious, so that the character, the persona, of one's mind, is able to make any sense of them. The character is the one who interacts with the world, but he is neither the initiator nor the end goal of such inspirational realizations. Comparatively, I could say that the personality is neither the alpha nor the omega of it. The character is affected by it, for sure, if the inspired communication was successful, but he is still dwelling in the unconscious, therefore only aware of second-hand translations and not of that direct knowing. That knowing emerges as an act of faith, of trust in the character's ego, that the character can and should help to stay healthy. And through it, Faith or trust in the true individual life that generated both ego and character. This is why parables and other types of stories are used for truth-pointing myths. Because for the character or personality living in the unconscious or amnesiac level of the world's mind, such concepts are nearly impossible to grasp because the personality's direct access to consciousness and memory is very limited. Discernment and discrimination is needed on the part of the character and ego in order to distinguish a myth from a hoax. Please refer to the contemplation named Stories, Myths versus Hoaxes. And the compass for that in a relatively healthy ego is a subtle type of emotion. In the previous contemplation named Emotions, Images and Words, it is mentioned that emotions have direct access to all these levels, permeating them, being somewhat omnipresent. Since emotion is, therefore, able to access all levels of the soul, it is the most suitable tool to bring back a response to the character level that requires presence and attention, not programmed automatisms to decipher. That type of subtle emotion can be paralleled with intuition. Intuition needs to be experienced and practiced. It is not something that is unconsciously known, like fear is. What is meant by that is that fear, for instance, does not require consciousness of any kind, no reasoning, comparison, nor evaluation. Intuition, on the other hand, needs to be recognized through an inner voyage that is undertaken by the character into its own dark lack of consciousness. That voyage offers one's own metaphorical lamp to the character, 
in the form of intuition that is also strengthened and powered the more it is used and, consequently, the more the connection between the individual unconsciousness of personality level and the individual living truth beyond the world's mind is established. With that in mind, let us then take another look at the prodigal son, also known as the lost son, parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Now one of the aspects that shines through from this story is the implied idea that the elder brother, who remained always obedient in the father's estate, sharing in all his wealth and bliss, will one day also choose to depart. This potential emerges from the resentment he manifests towards his father's reaction when his wayward brother returns. His pride had been hurt. He was obedient and respectful, but obedience and respect did not earn his father's preference. In his perception, which is faulty and unconscious as any personality is, their father preferred the wayward son who returned, instead of him who always stayed and obeyed. However, the father's reaction of joy and of hosting a feast in honor of his younger son return has a deeper implication than mere preference. His younger son had died and now lives again. He had been lost and now is found. 
That is, his younger son can now truly live in bliss and wisdom in his father's estate, because he now knows why it is beautiful and blissful. He is no longer potentially proud nor ashamed, but humble in wisdom. The older son only thinks his father prefers his returned brother because that faulty perception sprouted from ignorance of both the beauty and bliss of the father's estate and the ugliness and suffering of the world. That is, the older brother has no wisdom or experience to compare with. He only has his innate innocence. That lack of wisdom brought forth the first hatching of pride that had, until then, only been potential and never manifest. Quoting the Gospel of the Living What do the beautiful know of their own beauty, if not by interaction with the other? What do the beautiful know of its source? What do the beautiful know of themselves as they perceive their perfection without ever having seen the ugly? So it is implied that the older son not only eventually joined in the celebrations, but also felt that he himself was lacking something that his brother had brought back. That seed will probably cause him to ask for his inheritance and roam the world, like his brother did, because his brother, return, changed his relationship with his father's estate. Previously, he had just been. Now, he wanted to be and know. To do that, he would also have to go into the house of mirrors, facing his potential pride and shame reflected back at him, until he deeply knew why his father's estate was beautiful and blissful. Something that can only happen after he had confronted his potential shadows of pride and shame amidst evil and false good. Like his younger brother, he may decide to one day go into the world, wear the world's clothes, lie and be lied to, hurt and be hurt, feel proud and ashamed. Yet that is a choice that is in his hands. His father loves him as much as his brother, regardless of what he decides. If I am allowed to compare it with another myth, I compare it to Tolkien's One Ring. The older brother will also have to be a ring bearer, and face his own temptation potential, be it good or evil, proud or shameful. His father will never force him to do it, because he is a true living father. Like Christopher Tolkien stated in an interview about his father, J.R.R. Tolkien, Gandalf, if he had the ring, would be far worse than Sauron, because he would be righteous and self-righteous, and order coerce the world to its own good. And that was one of my father's greatest fears. It was the coercion for good ends. My individual view is that the older brother will someday leave too, that is, if he hasn't already, and submerge into the world. And after all the good and evil that he will embody, he will be wise, humble, and return home to innocence for another celebration, this time in his honor. Because then he will know why he and his father and his brother and his home are beautiful.